We as Homo sapiens have had a long and in some cases convoluted evolutionary history. From the vast savannas of Africa to the sprawling cities of New York, it is truly remarkable to see how far we've come. In this video, I will cover the point in time from which our ancestors began their path to us, from how we went from quadrupeds to bipeds and why our brain size increased. How was all of this possible, however? All will be answered in this video, which will detail some of our earliest ancestors, that being the Australopithecines. Australopithecines originated during the Pliocene Epoch in what is now Central Africa, before spreading throughout the continent into many different species. Around this time, the African climate was beginning to shift, and was becoming drier and more open with less forest cover, with the shrublands and grasslands becoming more widespread, something that later set up the evolution of the Australopithecines. While indeed the reduction in forest cover around this time was one of the factors that kick-started our evolution, the road to us started further back with Sahelanthropus, back in the Miocene. Existing around 7 million years ago, this places Sahelanthropus very close to the proposed split between chimpanzees and the ancestors of Homo sapiens, although hybridisation may still have been occurring as recently as 4 million years ago. It is unknown whether Sahelanthropus was an obligate biped or not, as no postcranial remains have been discovered as of yet, although claims for an anteriorly placed foramen magnum suggest that bipedalism was not out of the question, as this is a posture that is much closer to modern humans than to chimpanzees. This would mean that bipedalism in apes dates back far before our brain size increased, as Sahelanthropus, as well as the later Australopithecines, had an endocranial capacity of around 460 cubic centimetres, give or take. To give an idea of how big this is compared to other apes, as an example, chimpanzees have a capacity of around 385 cubic centimetres, and we, as Homo sapiens, have an average capacity of around 1,450 cubic centimetres. That means that in life, Australopithecines, despite their more human-like appearance, were still at this point most similar to chimpanzees on a cognitive level. The origins of bipedalism amongst our early ancestors is not as clear-cut as it once was, and nowadays there are at least 12 distinct hypotheses as to how and why bipedalism evolved in humans, as well as when. For this, I will be talking about the most notable of these hypotheses, and see how each compares to one another. The first and most notable hypothesis, being the Savannah Hypothesis, states accordingly that hominins descended from the trees and achieved bipedalism through environmental pressures brought on by the changing Pliocene climate, which would have forced animals out of the shrinking forest habitats and out onto the open grasslands. This hypothesis being presented in both Walking with Beasts and other related media like Walking with Cavemen. The bipedal anatomy would allow hominids to look over tall grasses to watch out for predators and or to spot prey, as well as possibly being helpful in reducing the surface area of the body exposed to the sun, helping in regulating body temperature. The hypothesis proved to be influential, but in its early years the hypothesis was unconstrained by data, as the fossil record of hominids was not as well known as it is today, and little was known from a paleoclimate point of view. Current evidence indicates that bipedality was established millions of years before the widespread expansion of savanna grasslands, as we'll get into with the later hypotheses. Others have stated that hominins had already achieved bipedalism before it was put into use in the savanna. This hypothesis, known as the postural feeding hypothesis, asserts that chimpanzees forage bipedally, and do this to grab food from overhead branches, if necessary. Eventually, these bipedal habits would then become more regular amongst hominins, as it was most convenient in reaching for food. This hypothesis has been supported by Dr. Kevin Hunt, a professor at Indiana University, who while analysing fossil anatomy, noticed that a species of Australopithecine, that being Australopithecus afarensis, had very similar features in the hands and shoulders to chimpanzees. Chimpanzee arms are designed for hanging and grasping, and are thus thick-walled to hold their bodies off of the ground, as well as possessing curved fingers, with Australopithecus afarensis also possessing these same features. As well as this, Australopithecines also have shallow rib cages and robust clavicular anchors. 
This shows that Australopithecines were also at home in forested environments and not just open savannah. The hip and hind limbs clearly indicate bipedalism, but with shorter legs comparative to the body, terrestrial locomotion was likely not as efficient when compared to later hominids, as it has been noted that their movements generated extra stress in the hip region when compared to later hominins. This shows that Australopithecines were akin to an intermediate stage in our evolution, possessing traits of both ancestral hominids and Homo sapiens. For these reasons, Hunt argues that bipedalism evolved more as a terrestrial feeding posture than a walking posture. A similar study conducted by Thorpe et al. looked at how the most arboreal of the great apes, the orangutan, held on to supporting branches in order to navigate the branches that were either too flexible or unstable otherwise. The study found that in more than 75% of locomotive instances, the orangutan used their hands to stabilise themselves while they navigated across thinner branches. From this study, it showed that even the most arboreal apes utilise some form of bipedalism to navigate through forests. The increased fragmentation of forests as the Pliocene began could have contributed to the increase of bipedalism in order to navigate across the diminishing forests. The findings also shed light on anatomical traits Australopithecines possessed that still showed an arboreal lifestyle, such as very flexible ankle joints and the powerful forelimbs which I mentioned earlier, all of which are adaptations for walking around amongst branches. From this, it is evident that early bipedal hominids still retained adaptations for climbing trees even when they had already begun to walk upright. Potentially then, bipedalism evolved in the trees and was later applied to the savanna as a vestigial trait, as the hypothesis suggests. As well as this, ancient pollen has been found in the soil in the locations many of the Australopithecine fossils were found, meaning that the area in which they once lived was likely to be wetter than previously expected, and has only in recent years become arid. There are many more hypotheses out there that have been discussed on the origins of bipedalism, whether that be for threat displays, wading, and or thermoregulation. The evolution of bipedalism in Australopithecines was likely a combination of all of these aforementioned factors, and that not one single factor was responsible for the shift in biology. Whatever the case, the evolution of bipedalism in our earliest ancestors brought a great deal of advantages, and the development of bipedalism was the first step in the story of how we came to be. With a bipedal build, this led to Australopithecines going through a large array of anatomical change in order to accommodate for their way of life. An example of this was the forward movement in the position of the foramen magnum, as this allows the skull to be properly supported for a bipedal animal. One of the most significant adaptations came in the case of the spine, in which it has been noted in both Australopithecines and Homo sapiens that there is sexual dimorphism, e.g. the difference between male and female individuals, in the lumbar vertebrae, in which the spinal curvature of the female backbone becomes more pronounced when pregnant, which ensures that the weight of the developing baby is placed directly above the pelvis for an easier birth, as well as reducing pain and fatigue for the woman's back muscles, helping to maintain stability and posture. The male spine, in comparison, is inherently more rigid when compared to the more flexible female spine, as they do not carry such weight. This trait has also been found in Australopithecines, in this case the species Africanus, which shows that even early on in our evolution, adaptations for maintaining a bipedal body were already there, and that some of the adaptations present in Homo sapiens were also present in our earliest ancestors, which is truly remarkable. Through the adoption of a bipedal posture, this brought both advantages such as the freeing of the forelimbs, allowing for the manipulation of objects, but also its disadvantages. Due to the narrowing of the pelvis to allow for a vertical posture, the difficulties of labour became increasingly more challenging. Known commonly as the obstetrical dilemma, this hypothesis is used to explain why humans often require assistance from other humans during childbirth in order to avoid complications. Labelled as a biological trade-off imposed by the evolutionary pressures of bipedalism and larger brain size, the adaptations to combat this dilemma are found even in the Australopithecines. This intermediate stage of the widening of the pelvis is found within Australopithecines, and in later hominids such as Homo erectus, 
the dilemma became even more difficult to live with, as cranium size continued to increase. In order to combat this dilemma, Australopithecines adapted to cope with their bipedal nature in order to ensure their offspring were born safely. Because of the pelvis narrowing in hominids, this brought a great deal of biological implications for our ancestors. For one, the gestation length in humans became shorter in comparison to other primates of comparable size. Comparative data suggests from across mammals and primates that there is a metabolic constraint on how large and energetically expensive a foetus can grow before it must leave the mother's body. The reason for this shorter gestation period is likely an adaptation to ensure the survival of both the mother and child, as it leads to altriciality. This means that offspring are born unable to fend for themselves and require extensive care from their parents, this being found in most passerines, dogs and cats, and in this case, humans. Because of the obstetrical dilemma, the infant has to be born early, as if the infant is too large, it could result in both its mother's death as well as its own. Therefore, the birth of an infant throughout our evolutionary history gradually became shorter and shorter, thereby making the child increasingly more premature. Modern humans, as an example, are born with only 25% of their brains fully developed at birth, which compared to modern non-human primates, the infant has around 45-50% to brain development. Amongst Australopithecines, the cranium was around the same size as a modern chimpanzee, so altriciality was not at its present extent, although the changes in pelvic structure meant that neonasal rotation became necessary for safe birth. A number of Australopithecine species emerged in the Pliocene, including genres such as A. afarensis, A. africanus, A. anamensis, and A. sibida, to name a few. Throughout their evolutionary history, Australopithecines are proposed to have branched off into the distinct genus Paranthropus, or the robust Australopithecines, with the Australopithecines that led to us being known as the gracile Australopithecines. The genus Paranthropus, that which includes the species P. aeopithecus, P. boisei, and P. robustus, were morphologically quite distinct from ancestral Australopithecines, being bulkier and possessing a sagittal crest in order to anchor large muscles. While we're on the topic of Australopithecine taxonomy, Homo habilis, iconically known for being among the earliest examples of hominins practicing tool use, has had a tumultuous taxonomy. Debate over whether or not it should be placed in the genus Homo or Australopithecus has been going on for years. Homo habilis was short and had disproportionately long arms compared to modern humans, although it had a less protruding face than any known Australopithecine. A main argument that has been used to support the classification as the first Homo species was its use of flaked stone tools, which had not been found in Australopithecines until recently. And yes, I said until recently, as evidence for tool use amongst members of Australopithecus have been found, meaning that the use of tools came 800,000 years earlier than previously thought, and in Australopithecines no less. So for Homo, or Australopithecus habilis, its taxonomy for now at least remains largely uncertain. This video was made in collaboration between me and three other science-based YouTubers. Putting this together and collaborating with one another was a great experience, and I was very glad we could all get together to participate and make videos on such interesting topics. I would highly recommend subscribing to all of them, as they all make their own great videos on interesting topics. If you like my videos, you'll be sure to enjoy theirs. With that, I hope you enjoyed the video, and be sure to look out for anything in the future. See you later!